This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 1049, recorded on September 29, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And it is 51 Fahrenheit, 11 C, and pouring rain here in Western Mass yet again, um, which is a huge problem for the Eastern States Exposition, which is the um, the New England multi-state fair that happens every year this time, a time of year at Springfield. Uh, in a fairgrounds there, and they've been absolutely clobbered by this because they've just been washed out day after day. 16 C here in New York and raining and it rained yesterday and today we have big floods here in, in the city. Uh, you know, when your phone gives you that emergency warning oh, yeah. thingy, it came up a flood this morning. Man, where is it? There it is, emergency alert, National Weather Service, flash flood warning until 2.30 p.m. So we've passed that. Dangerous and light, threatening situation do not attempt to travel unless you are fleeing an area subject to flooding or under an evacuation order pretty scary well, the national weather service uses the term flee that's flee. usually bad <laughs> fleas also joining us from austin texas rich condit <laughs> hi everybody uh we got 96 degrees and uh sunny uh, and it's going to, I mean, at 96 is better than 106, I'll tell you, by a long shot. And I, it, it seems to me that the plants uh, uh, have a cutoff at about 100 degrees, okay? At least the plants that we have. I mean, there's some Texas native plants, even those get kind of stressed out over 100 degrees. But um, so once it dropped down to the mid-90s, the uh, bougainvillea growing up the front of our house went completely bonkers, and it's gorgeous. I need to take a picture and send it uh send it to you guys anyway we're looking at uh uh mid 90s low to mid 90s through about wednesday and then it looks like there's a cold front coming through that uh hopefully will bring some rain and it's going to drop to the low to mid 80s man i can't wait cold mm-hmm. snap yeah and from madison new jersey brianne barker hi it is 62 and rainy here um, not quite as bad as some of the images I've seen of New York City, um, so I don't need to flee. Uh, <laughs> but it looked looks bad there. Uh, good luck getting back, Vincent. I know I, I don't. So Dixon said I'm never going to get home, but it's some hours before I have to leave. Like they've yeah. shut down the entire subway. Yeah, well, uh, you know, it depends on the New Jersey transit because I don't need to yeah. take the subway. You just walk to the train, right? It's two blocks. Uh, Another one of those dangerous things is when the New York MTA uses the term high tide. (laughs) (laughs) They'll they'll say like, you know, this train has to be closed down before high tide. The trains are running. Sometimes. I mean, they are, some of them are suspended down uh, along the Jersey coast, but you know, the trains are still running as as far as I can tell. But you know, I can always stay here at the incubator. (laughs) I have, I bought a while ago an inflatable bed. <laughs> I have a pillow. I have a blanket. I just need to go get a toothbrush and I'll be all set. It, it, is it nice and warm in the incubator? Should be. <sighs> you know, um, it's, it's okay. It's usually chilly because the air conditioning is... But it's like 5% CO2, which oh, is... Yeah, it's no good. 5% CO2? Right? It's an incubator. It's an incubator. Oh, yeah, I didn't get your joke. I'm sorry. Yeah. What, sorry. what an idiot I am. <laughs> Not you. Um, yeah, it's. It. I wish it were warm, but I actually have a sweater here. But yeah, I, that was one concern I did have. It, it's not so warm. Cause, uh, but I, actually, I do have a heater. Yeah, I have a space heater. I could always use that. Just be careful. With the space heater? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're a major, It's. I assume it's electrical. Yeah. Um, major cause of fire. The space so heater. Just if you tilt it an inch, it turns off. Good. Yeah. Because <laughs> I was trying to tilt it up to blow something the other day, and it kept shutting off. So, um, I could. So I can stay here. 
I have a blanket that was given to me when I visited Cornell last year. <laughs> the students gave me a Cornell blanket. So I brought it in here. I have that. I have a couple of pillows on the couch. So in the pinch, I could stay here. Everything's okay at home? You just happened to pick these things up for the incubator? <laughs> yeah, I, I just picked them up okay. for the incubator, yeah. Um, okay. Um, we, if, you, if you enjoy this banter <laughs> and all the science that follows, please support us. We'd love to have your support. Uh, we run this science communication company. Uh, on your philanthropy, we don't use ads to make any income. None of our videos on YouTube are monetized. So uh, I believe that you shouldn't have advertising on educational products. So, you know, you have a textbook. There are no ads in the textbook, right? <laughs> so uh, we depend on your support, microbe.tv slash contribute. Uh, don't forget Amy Rosenfeld has a position open for a research assistant in her laboratory at the Center for Biological Evaluation and Review at the FDA which is a government laboratory and who knows, do you think the government's going to shut down? If so, all these government labs shut down too, unfortunately. Yeah. But, oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And that might happen like at midnight. Yeah. It's really not good folks to it's shut down. It's so really not. Stupid. Come on. It's so stupid that you can't come to an agreement. It's just, it's a stunt and yeah, it's it's, a stunt. there's no reason for it. But, um, this is a research assistant to work on enteroviruses, immune, immune responses, and pathogenesis, develop animal models. All BSL2 work. And if you go to the PDF in the show notes, there'll be an email uh, for Amy, which you can use to get more information. Now, some of you may remember the fundraiser we did with vaccinated.us last year. We, we sold spike protein t-shirts around the world to raise the ambient level of public health reason. That was one lot. of my favorite t-shirts. Absolutely. Oh, favorite. I still wear mine regularly. It's very cool. Me too. It was fun. The, the art was cool and uh, stimulated some useful discussion. It raised money for micro TV. Yeah, really s impressive amount of fundraising at the end of 2022. And so, you know, it's a big circle. This uh, fundraising fuels our scientific communication. So I'm happy to announce we're going to do another round of fundraising right now for Halloween. And this is going to be a costumes for a cause theme. The people at vaccinated.us point out that hostility towards vaccines and public health science seems to be hardening in a way that could potentially tilt public opinions so far towards misunderstanding that it could jeopardize our ability to optimize policy and strategy for future pandemics. Uh, those guys at vaccinated.us think the psychology literature is indicating that vaccine hostility is spreading as much like a social fashion as a collective intellectual conclusion. So the impacts of our science communication work here at TWIV could be amplified if it's supported by efforts to make vaccine reason fashionable again. Hey, if public sentiment toward vaccines is one part rational thinking and one part fashion, here's to a little bit more of both. We want to encourage you to go to vaccinated.us and build a Halloween costume that is an homage to the superheroic vaccine scientists, medical professionals, and everyone who opted in to vaccinate and protect each other by slowing the spread of COVID during the most deadly pandemic of the century. I should say SARS-CoV-2, right? If you've ever seen the spike protein shirts, you might have noticed they look a little like superhero shirts. So last year, some creative TWIV listeners turned them into superhero costumes. And this year we want to amplify that. It takes a global village to create the most successful and impactful vaccination campaign in the history of the world. And that is what we just did over the last couple of years together. So go to vaccinated.us and build a Halloween costume that expresses a nod of solidarity with all the people who came together to make that happen. And when you check out, please enter the promo code microbe TV without a period, just microbe TV or TWIV. And the majority of profits will, from those sales will come back to support the science communication work that we do here on our programs. Uh, so, I have a couple, I have a superhero costume. I have a cape and, and a mask, and I'm going to take some pictures 
And any of you guys interested, I have extra capes. Uh, I'll send them to you. You can. <laughs> I, I was thinking, I was like, oh, so I could wear my T-shirt with a cape. That would be perfect. Yeah. So have you looked at the vaccinated.us yeah. website? It's got some examples of this. It just as you say, the the spike the spike T-shirt and a cape and a mask. There's one <laughs> helmet as well. It's yeah. So cool. I'm going to send Rich <laughs> and Brienne and Alan a cape and a mask. And you guys, if you get inspired, take a picture and we'll put okay. them uh, on our website perfect. and send them in. Okay. Today, uh, I think we, we ought to be wearing headphones too. You know. <laughs> yeah. <it's laughs> right. All right. Today we have a cat theme as you will see in our science. And uh, at the top, I have a correction. And we were talking about treating cats with feline infectious peritonitis with remdesivir last week. And one of our listeners sent in a, an article about that. So it turns out that remdesivir will, will inhibit that virus. So uh, I said that I was wrong about how it's given to cats. It's given subcutaneously. Because when you give it to them, I am intramuscularly, it hurts the cat. And how do you know it hurts the cat? You can imagine. The cat yells. Yes. Right? Yeah. They make it very clear when something yeah. happens. Yeah, that's pretty obvious. <laughs> so subcutaneously. I had said intramuscularly because intravenously hurts them. Intravenously is how it's given to people. But they tried I am and that hurts. So sub-Q is good. So thank you for the correction on that. Our, our first paper, and you know, I'm walking in today, I'm thinking, why do we call them snippets? They're both long. They're both a half hour. Right? <laughs> Alan said this a long time ago. Just call them papers. Yeah. And, you know, when you first- We, can't, we tried the snippet idea and it just doesn't work when, on TWIV. We end up going on for a while. So I'm going to call it paper. You know, the, the, the thing is when you first pick a paper, you don't know how long you're going to be talking about it. It's hard to predict, right? After- a thousand episodes, I can tell you that we're going to talk about them for a long time. <laughs> minimum <laughs> minimum 30, 30 minutes is a good rule of thumb, I think. Yeah, we always do 30 minutes because everyone yeah. has things to say. Anyway, the first paper today is in Nature. This is an accelerated article preview. You know, they, This is very interesting. They, they wanted to get it out there soon so that everyone could see it, but it's behind a paywall. Yes. Yeah. So- Open it up. Nature. Yeah, I was actually, I, I saw the papers and I said, oh, I'm probably going to have to get somebody to send me a copy of the cell paper because Elsevier is always a pain about that. And 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 then, I oh, Nature paper this on long COVID. This has got to be open access. Nope. Nope. I know. <laughs> Sorry and, about and, that, And everybody. I tried to download it on the train. And, and the cell oh paper is open access. Because of all the rain, the cell service was horrible. And that's how I oh. link up on my laptop. Anyway. Uh, distinguishing features of long COVID identified through immune profiling. So now it's the second week in a row we're doing a, a long COVID paper because good good stuff is coming out. Uh, this comes from, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven first authors, John Klein, Jamie Wood, Jillian Jacobs, Rahul Dop Dodapkar, Peiwen Liu, Jeff Gelhausen, Alexandra Tabachnikova, and uh, three corresponding authors, David Van Dyke, Aaron Ring, David Putrino, and Akiko Iwasaki. So this is a collaboration. A lot of people at Yale School of Medicine. We have some people uh, in uh, UCLA. And, and we there's have... a whole pile of people between those first well, authors. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of people authors. behind. And then there's- This is uh, a huge, huge effort. So people from Mount Sinai, Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. As you know from our discussion last week, uh, after acquiring SARS-CoV-2 infection, um, a, a number of people develop long-term sequelae, post-acute. Um, wait, what's the pass? They, they're, here they're calling it post-acute infection, infection syndrome, because PACE or PAIS. PACE, yeah, because um, they, they were, their point is it happens with many virus infections, yeah. not just right. Yeah, so and I, I like to see that. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know much about uh, other uh, long uh, sequelae of other virus infections, but uh, you know the, the it's clearly stated here that it does happen. So I think it's important to understand that apparently this sort of thing is not unique. Yeah, to right. SARS-CoV-2 yes, for sure. Well, and I think yes. that that's you know also an important point is that not only do perhaps y you not know or I certainly don't know. Um, I think that we as a scientific community don't 
always know a lot about that because we haven't always had the numbers to really identify these things um, other than saying, oh, that person has something weird going on with them. But now because we can see so many uh, infections around the same time, we've actually, and we have these immune profiling abilities, we can start to really uh, understand and distinguish this. Yeah. And in fact, in the introduction, they even name check uh, MECFS, which is this syndrome that's come up a few times on, on here and also on Virology blog, um, regular posts about that, uh, which is this long standing, like decades long thing of what the heck is going on with these cases. Um, and so long COVID is thought to be part of that spectrum. But as Vincent pointed out, that, you know, this is huge number of cases that showed up all of a sudden because of the pandemic. And so now we can actually get real numbers on here. And another important factor here, I think, is that everybody got the acute infection around the same time. Right. You know, within a couple of years of each other. And yeah. I'm thinking about the uh, relationship between, just as an overview, between this paper and what we did last week. Because last week was sort of uh, symptom level uh, characterization of long COVID. Right, right. And mm -hmm. this is down to mostly focused on the immune system. These people yeah. are immunologists. Uh, but this, and, and it's, uh, it, it's getting down to the point where you can kind of ask whether uh, any of the things that we'll discuss today are, uh, you know, sort of how they relate to the symptoms, put it that way, and, yeah. and, and how they relate mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. virus infection, trying to get slowly but surely after a sort of cause and effect. Yeah. Last week, we were talking about PASC, which is post-acute sequelae of COVID. Mm -hmm. But now it's P-A-I-S, PACE. P -A -I -S, P -A -I -S, P -A -I -S. What, I don't know how we're pronouncing it, but it's the post-acute infection syndrome more broadly because all of the people here are not COVID patients. Yeah. So as you know, uh, long COVID presents as a mix of symptoms, uh, unremitting fatigue, post-exertional malaise, cognitive impairment, autonomic dysfunctions, and other manifestations as well that impair people's lives. Uh, as they say, estimates vary, but prospective studies suggest about one in eight individuals with COVID experience persistent somatic symptoms attributable to past infection with SARS-CoV-2. That's a very high number. Yeah, yeah it's I, huge. And it's um, all of the same problems that have plagued MECFS characterization for decades yeah. have plagued studying long COVID, um, the one of the first of which is case definition. Right. And so you see these wildly varying, est varying estimates of, you know, there are a gazillion people with this or there are 10 people with this, not quite that extreme, but, um, but there, there's this huge range of how prevalent this is based on how you define it and how long you say long COVID is. Cause somebody who has symptoms a month after, is that long COVID or is that just taking a while to get over the acute infection? Um, but yeah, so this is, I think this is kind of a middle of the road number that one in eight have some kind of extended course that's not what you'd expect of, a, of an acute disease. And the ones they're looking at in this study um, are further out than that. So I think they're looking at a pretty definitively long COVID population here. All right. So they have um, two cohorts of of participants in this study uh, and they're going and they what they do is they going to apply largely immunophenotyping uh, and machine learning to identify potential biomarkers of long COVID right so can we do some kind of lab test to identify the syndrome um, <clears throat> and so we have uh, we have one study called my LC my long COVID 183 participants we have 101 long COVID. Uh, we have 42 um, controls, case controls, right? That's what CC is, correct? Uh, and yes, yeah. um, convalescent, convalescent controls. controls. Convalescent controls. So those are people who had COVID, but not long. That's correct. Right. Uh, and then we have the we had 42 HC, which are healthcare workers, um, who uh, sorry, healthy controls. <laughs> Healthy controls um, who uh, uninfected vaccinated controls, HC. 
So that's the MyLC. That's one study site uh, at Mount Sinai in New York. And then they had 90 participants uh, from Yale New Haven Hospital. Um, and in the end, they have 268 people who make it through uh, all of the screening and uh, are the subject of this test. Uh, most of the infections uh, in the long COVID group happened when uh, the original, the ancestral WA1 strain of SARS-CoV-2 was circulating. So uh, week 7 through 17 of 2020, and it always and it is an interesting question to know how subsequent variants fare here, but we don't do that in this study as well. Um, uh, so they calculate what's called a long COVID propensity score um, <clears throat> to see how um, these, these symptoms array across uh, all of these uh, individuals. So it's a single classification metric and um, among the, uh, so that'll come up in, in a bit. And then um, among the, the so have, a lot of these people are doing self-reporting, right? So they have a long COVID group who are doing self-reporting uh, and fatigue, brain fog, memory difficulty, and confusion are the most common sim self-reported symptoms. Brain, fatigue is 87%. So that's a big one. Brain fog, 78%. Memory difficulty, 62%. Confusion, 55%. And then there were a few others. Uh, of lower percentages as well. Uh, and they then said, can we divide these into groups or clusters to try and find people with similar sets of self-reported symptoms? So is this some groups of symptoms that are always reported together? And they identified three uh, LC clusters, clusters uh, one, two, and three. And these are they're bifurcated by LCPS, by this long COVID propensity score. Um, so that, that comes into play as well. And then they look at uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells uh, in these individuals, and they say that these populations have a significant difference uh, among the MyLC cohorts, um, the, in particular the median level of non-conventional monocytes in the LC group was higher than those in uh, other groups. What's that, was, Brianne? What's a non-conventional monocyte? So a non-conventional monocyte is really just a monocyte that does not have the first set of markers that we have described to talk about monocytes. Mm -hmm. um, so they may be slightly um, activated uh, differently, um, or it may just they may have uh, different um, origin. Okay, so that's higher when you compare these individuals with long COVID with the controls. That's clearly higher for whatever reason, right? Uh, these also th these um, people with LC also had significantly lower circulating populations of what is it? CDC ones, dendritic cells, Brian. CDC ones are conventional dendritic cells. Conventional dendritic cells. Okay. So non-conventional monocytes and conventional, conventional are up. Conventional dendritic cells are down. And other populations did not show these effects. So it's not like every population they look at. It's just these two percentages. Uh, the median relative percentage of B lymphocytes higher in both, um, well, in, in uh, individuals with LC, let's put it that way. Um, and, but not circulating T lymphocytes. They were not strikingly different. Um, circulating CD4 positive central memory cells were lower in the LC group. Uh, and then uh, they say if, when we stimulate CD4 positive cells uh, from uh, individuals with long COVID, they make uh, higher amounts of intracellular IL-2. Now, Brianne, the stimulation they're doing here, forbal, meristate, acetate, and ionomycin, what is that doing? So uh, the combined PMA ionomycin treatment is a way that you stimulate all T cells um, and you kind of get around T cell receptor stimulation. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a chemical stimulation that turns on the signaling that happens downstream of the T cell receptor. Got it. All right. So those, when you stimulate those cells, they make more IL-2. Yeah. And one thing that's sort of already interesting about this is that you can already take these types of data, while it's not always clear, um, you know, what this or that 
type of um, cell type might tell you, you could use this partially for diagnosis. That's right. Yeah. Um, you could, you know, if, if people are worried about is, is this long COVID, um, what's going on, this yeah. is now a potential diagnostic. Yeah. I, I, mean, I think, remember, the, the, the numbers are smallish here. So this has to be validated and course, bigger studied. Yeah. But yeah, if it turned out to be, that's how you start. You start by finding mm -hmm. things that might be markers and you go out and you look in more people and you see how it parses. Yeah. Which would help tremendously with this problem of figuring out who has it, who doesn't, and for how long. Right. Yeah. Right. And so that whole heterogeneity thing, the it could be going from between you know ten people and everyone have it, um, could be useful to actually have a diagnostic <laughs> yeah. criteria. Uh, then they looked at antibody responses to SARS-CoV-2, uh, anti-S1 spike subunit one levels in the LC group significantly higher than in the CC. Um, and unvaccinated participants who had long COVID had higher anti-N protein IgG levels. So they, they did some modeling, which showed that uh, having long COVID is a predictor of um, and these anti-spike humoral responses. They also looked for, to map where these epitopes were, and they were able to do that, but I don't, I don't think we need to go into that. Um, they, and note that these are spike antibodies after infection. That's right. As well as vaccination. It's not just after vaccination. Right. Yeah, the, the only thing, I think the note that came out to me with the um, antigen specificity is that there are apparent differences. The long COVID participants seem to have slight differences in which amino acids. I don't know if there's any significance to that, though. Yeah, I don't know either. They also looked at circulating hormones in, in immune min mediators in plasma, okay? And one of the things that stuck out is uh, people in the um, LC, my, the my LC cohort, had different levels of cortisol complement, galactin-1, CCL4, April, LH, and IL-5. Although they are very struck by the cortisol differences. I think that's it's a, kind of the biggest. It's the biggest yeah. one, yeah. Um, then they they say, okay, so some of the theories are that long COVID is uh, and the underlying mechanism may involve autoantibodies. So they look at that. They look for autoantibodies against six thousand extracellular and secreted human proteins. And, you know, we all make some or some antibodies against our own proteins, but the, the, these did not differ across the groups. So there was no difference between the, the long COVID and other groups here. So they, they actually conclude later that they don't think autoantibodies are involved here. Which is good because some of the authors in this paper have been um, kind of at the forefront of looking at autoantibodies and severe COVID. Um, yeah. And so their work... Um, you know, might be something that made you think about, well, what's up with autoantibodies and long COVID? Right. And so it's good that they use those exact same methods to indicate that they don't see a difference in long COVID um, in the ways that they had in some of their previous work. Of course, we have antibodies to interferons, autoantibodies in severe COVID, right? Yeah, but in then, some patients, some not patients, everybody. But not, uh, not with long COVID, apparently. It's not a, correlate, a correlator. Um, then they look at um, antibody responses to uh, other other viral proteins. Uh, and hey, what happened to? I didn't highlight anything here. <laughs> oh, well, the, yeah, this was this was a really cool part. They because there's been a lot of speculation and some data that something like. EBV antibody levels, Epstein-Barr virus, or some other herpes virus yeah. antibody levels might be contributing to this. Yeah, so they do problem. find some uh, differences um, for several Epstein-Barr virus uh, proteins, EBV, uh, varicella zoster virus, and um, so differences between the long COVID and the other. Well, so patients. is the idea that the antibodies are causing the issues or that reactivation is causing the issue and reactivation is just triggering antibodies? Yeah, I, I think they're thinking- They seem to be leaning toward reactivation. Reactivation, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, when when we get to the end of this, 
may as well bring it up now. I uh, I wind up wondering. So are these things uh, induced during the infection, uh, or uh, uh, happen during the infection and are characteristic of the long COVID, or are there people who have these things going on that make them somehow susceptible to a longer uh, course of disease because of these problems? Like maybe you already have uh, an EBV reactivation and uh, you get COVID. Yeah, um, yeah, and maybe that exacerbates then that predisposes the problem. Predisposes you to, predisposes to long COVID. You. Right. I don't know. I can't. I can't recall that they actually addressed that sort of the cause and effect uh, aspects of this uh, in the paper. But that was a significant question in my mind. And there's yeah. also there's an additional causative issue um, that still needs to be sorted out, which is: Are these things that they're measuring causing long COVID? Or are they effects of the underlying mechanism? Yeah, I suspect exactly. it's a mix. Mm -hmm. I suspect some right. of these are, are okay, because of the other immune stuff that's going on, EBV reactivated. Or because of mm. the EBV reactivation, this other immune stuff is going on. Exactly. And we don't know, we don't know what's causative and what's, right. yeah. what's we, caused. And, and they definitely uh, don't address those things, but I, you know, I get oh, no, it. That's, because, yeah, the, I mean, the study's how, not set up to. Yeah, I mean, but at the same time, <laughs> You'd have to know, like every person, when have you had your EBV reactivations, yes. and does that correlate to anything else? Yeah. So at this point, it's—I uh, realize this sounds like a dirty word because of my time on study section, but at this point, it's descriptive. Okay, you're describing, yes. but but it's imp it, it's important description because yes. it clearly distinguishes people with long COVID from others relative to these par parameters. Right, right. And so it makes yeah. it so that uh, you could potentially take somebody who says, you know, oh, man, I'm feeling like uh, this is going on for too long and do appropriate tests on them and say, yeah, you know, you've got a profile that really looks like long COVID. It, it's both a diagnostic thing yeah. and a hypothesis generating thing. Yes, yes. yes. exactly. Yeah, I mean, that, it's, And it's okay. It's okay to have descriptive data on something we know nothing about mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because we've yeah. got to start. I mean, if we can't describe it, if we can't even, as we've talked about, if we can't even <clears throat> define what this condition is, then mechanistic yeah. studies are premature. So right. yeah, absolutely. And it doesn't matter at this point, the underlying mechanism, if it's consistently right. associated, you could use it as a marker. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm <laughs> certainly not, I don't mean to imply that the paper is incomplete without this thing that's going to require decades to sort out, which is which of these things are causative. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that uh, interests me the most about this, if I got it right and correct me if I didn't, is that uh, one of the things we commented on this in the beginning, one of the things they did basically was survey people uh, and basically said, you know, do you have long COVID? <laughs> and a certain fraction of the population said, yeah, man. Uh, and it, the conclusion was that the people who self-reported that they mm. had long COVID clustered just fine. Yeah, that's right. Especially relative to all of these other measurements as having long COVID. So in a way, I really like this thinking about the MECFS thing. It sort of validates all that. Yeah. Okay. These people have, you know, yeah, yeah. For, for, for so long, people with MECFS, you come in complaining of all these symptoms and people say it's all in your head, you know, go away. All right. But this sort of helps, helps validate that, you know, if you're uh, feeling this kind of crappy, there's probably something wrong. And not only that, but this gives you a way to uh, look uh, under the, under the hood. Yeah. And uh, measure a few parameters that may be consistent with that. Yeah, and to be clear, this is not going to be a first line test where you go to your doctor and you say, "Yeah, I've got this set of symptoms." Because this this set of symptoms is extremely diverse and vague. Yeah. And could be a lot of things. And if you go to your doctor and say, "Yeah, you know, I've got this this persistent fatigue and just not feeling so great." They're going to do a blood test, and they're going to see if you have anemia and you, you know, the, the common stuff. Um, but if they get through all that and you don't have the, any of the known stuff, then this would be something to look at. Well, you know, how are your 
um, how are your monocytes and B cells looking and how is your EBV status looking? And um, then this could be done as a, as a single type of profile. One of the things that really stands out is, uh, is the cortisol, but I, I don't know enough yeah. about, uh, about that to know whether, you know, low cortisol could correlate with a whole bunch of other stuff as well. But there's several markers here because you got cortisol, yeah. you got the uh, EBV antibodies and a few other things as well. So you may be able to cross correlate several things and zero in on something that looks like long COVID. I'm also mm. interested in what these things look like in people who report ME, uh, yeah. ME-CFS and other uh, post-acute infection syndromes. One thing that's important about that cortisol is that they looked at some other hormones like ACTH, mm. um, another hormone relative to cortisol, and that did not come out as significant. So it's very specifically a cortisol thing mm -hmm. and not a general hormone thing. I asked Daniel yesterday if this made clinical sense. He said, yeah, people who, are, who have low cortisol are often fatigued. So it's consistent. So in fact, the last bit of the paper, they, they do some modeling to see which um, of what they measured correlates best. And, and they say that serum cortisol was the most significant predictor of long COVID status in this model. Um, so they're very excited about that. Now, now Akiko tweeted seven key findings. So I have them here listed. So first, as Rich said, patient reported outcomes are alone or sufficient to identify long COVID patients with 94% accuracy. Number two, immunophenotyping reveals increases in exhausted T cells, IL-4-6 double positive T cells, activated B cells, double negative B cells, and non-classical monocytes. So we didn't hit on all of those, but there they are. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 antibody responses are elevated in long COVID patients after vaccination. There's evidence of herpes virus reactivation by the antibody studies, EBV and VZV. No increases in autoantibodies. Um, and again, machine learning shows that long COVID can be predicted from immunological data alone. And the strongest predictor for both defining long COVID and predicting disease severity was low cortisol levels. So immunological data, a combination of immunological data and low cortisol. <clears throat> and so uh, they say, <laughs> their, their last sentence is, we, this study provides a basis for future investigations into the immunological underpinnings driving the genesis of long COVID. But of course, can also be used now to look at other cohorts and see how these things go. Because remember, this is, one time point after these individuals' infection, right? This is one time point, and if you look, I mean, it's five cohorts, 268 people, so it's like 50 people per cohort, not exactly, but it's not huge numbers, yeah. and now you've got some stuff to look at in larger numbers of people where you can say, instead of doing this entire battery of tests that they did in this paper, yeah. we're going to look at cortisol, we're going to look at, <clears throat> you know, these immunological markers and um, and do that in a much bigger group and do it at other time points. I really like, I hadn't thought about this. I really like the point that you guys were making at the top of this paper that because of the pandemic, there was a burst of this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and it really provides an opportunity to uh, identify large, large-ish cohorts and focus in on this. Yeah, Whereas yeah. Uh, previously, I mean, this has probably been, been going on with a bunch of different infections for a long period of time and may very well be the underpinning uh, of something like ME-CFS, but there just wasn't, you know, enough, um, a, a high enough concentration in a given period of time of these sure, that you could sure. point to and say, this is an infection and this stuff is happening. Okay? Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, I think a the, the, silver ish the, lining. Not yeah, really. maybe. <laughs> you know, all these other infections are they're asynchronous, right? They're yeah. exactly. Yeah. And so it's hard to pinpoint what who has what. Sporadic. It's like taking your car in, you know, with a mm -hmm. with a problem yeah. that shows up, you know. Once every uh, couple of weeks yeah, it makes right. this noise. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so <laughs> Yeah, it's always hard, and right? So what they do is say, 
oh, well, it's your uh, anti-lock brake system, and right. that'll only cost you $3,000, yeah. right? <laughs> Indeed. All right. Uh, that is, uh, there, there have been a couple of other uh, long COVID papers out as well, but this one is um, quite impressive. I probably just insulted an auto mechanic out there. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I want to do one, one sort. When we do a SARS-CoV-2 paper, I want to have some other virus now. Okay, we don't need to do two <laughs> papers, SARS-CoV-2 papers. So I'm looking and looking, and I saw this one, uh, which was it attracted me because it's about endogenous retroviruses, and then it's about cats, and I said, that's it. <laughs> And it's also, and then once you, I mean, that kind of gets your attention. And then once you start digging into it, it's like, wow, this is really cool. It's very interesting. Yeah. It's very cool. So this is a, a Cell Reports paper, a co-opted endogenous retroviral envelope promotes cell survival by controlling CTR1 mediated copper transport and homeostasis. This There's a mouthful. Yeah. yeah this is uh, from a number of groups uh, at the CNRS. In, but only five authors. In Montpellier, yeah. France, Sandrine Toury, Lise Chavot, Arnaud Lecant, Valérie Cournot, and Jean-Luc Battini. And this, uh, the other thing that's cool is this is about copper, which is uh, a favorite topic of Michael Schmidt. So hello, Michael. You probably are listening. <laughs> and, and Michael knows that copper is essential <laughs> for development of all eukaryotes. And just think of that when you throw out the pipes. <laughs> don't throw out don't throw out copper pipes. They're valuable. Copper pipes are very expensive, and and um, yeah. often plumbers recycle them. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, but you know, even though it's essential, you can't have too much of it. So it needs the levels need to be controlled. Well, you can have too much of it. That's the problem. You can, and then it's a problem. It would be toxic, yes. right? So you do you do want to regulate copper levels, and that's called copper homeostasis and we control the level of copper the homeostasis of copper by transporters in the membranes of cells and within cells they can pump copper uh, in and out and there there are a number of transporter proteins and uh, one of them is going to be featured in this paper ctr1 um and so, you know, in human cells anyway, um, if there's too much copper, uh, there's some proteins within the cell that go to the membrane, they release it, they bind copper within the cell. And sometimes uh, uh, there's, a, there's the transmembrane transporter CTR1, which sits in the plasma membrane and pumps copper in. If, it's, if there's too much copper, that protein can be pulled into the cell by endocytosis to stop copper from being taken up. So this, it's a lot of levels of control here. But the, the, you may say, what does this have to do with viruses? Well, here you go. Um, as you know, um, a good percentage of our genome, um, vertebrate genomes, are endogenous retroviruses. About 8% are remnants of previous retrovirus infection. Remember, retroviruses have an RNA genome, which is copied to DNA by the viral reverse transcriptase and then integrates into the host cell. It's an essential part of the viral reproduction cycle. But if that cell happens to be a germ cell, then the integrated DNA will be passed on to offspring. And we call it an endogenous retrovirus or an ERV. And, you know, we have a lot of ERVs in our genome. If you have 8% ERVs in our genome, most of them are inactive because that happened hundreds of thousands of years ago and they've accumulated. Uh, mutations because we don't need them, but there are some that we're using, and this is very cool, and that's what attracted me because this is another use for a retroviral protein. Now, everyone, many people may know that an envelope gene of a, of one of these endogenous retroviruses was co-opted many years ago to allow the placenta to develop, and, and that is. Um, and by many years ago, we mean hundreds of millions. Millions of years. Ago. And, and we don't mean 1962. Not just uh, <laughs> not just humans, but other animals as well. And uh, that allows us to give live birth. And that is a envelope protein that is has been now called syncytion. 
and it helps form the the outer cells, the syncytia trophoblasts of the placenta. Uh, Thank you for making that point, Alan, um, because (laughs) as I learned this morning, my students would think that something like 1962 was impossibly old. Impossibly old, yes. So uh, in particular for the newbies out there who may have joined us during the pandemic, I just want to uh, give you something to sink your teeth into here. Uh, The retrovirus that the public deals with probably most often now is HIV. Okay. So HIV yeah. is a retrovirus. These, as Vincent already said, it's an RNA virus. It's got, uh, it's implied already. It's got an envelope and it's got a capsid inside that, that, so there's a, in the, in the very inside, there's the RNA that's complexed with an enzyme that'll copy the RNA into DNA. And then there's a capsid outside of that. And then there's an envelope and a protein in the envelope, which is this envelope protein we've talked about, which is in many ways, the equivalent of the spike protein in the coronaviruses. That is, it's the thing that attaches the virus to the cell. And then there's a bunch of other ancillary proteins that help regulate the uh, uh, replication of the virus and fight off the immune system and all the rest of that stuff. So how big are these things, you know? I'm thinking about 10 kilobases. 10 10 is about HIV. Okay. Uh, Okay. And so, uh, and this integration uh, of nucleic acid into the genome is, is, is unusual. Okay. That these, these guys are pros at it in almost all other cases. I can think about it in a virus infection. uh, If there's any of that that goes on, it's accidental. Okay. This is deliberate. Okay. It's a part, uh, a part of the cycle. So when the integration happens, you're sticking in about 10 kilobases of DNA that includes this envelope protein uh, or the gene for the envelope protein and the capsid protein and the polymerase and all the ancillary things. And it's sitting there. And what do you say? 8% yep. of our DNA is these right. things yep. that we've accumulated over evolutionary time. That's phenomenal. It is. But mostly because of mutations that hit here and there, they aren't doing anything. But it and is a, a resource. You know, of genetic yeah. information yeah. Uh, that hey, might free be useful DNA. for something. Free right? DNA. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, uh, so that what Rich just described for HIV with, you know, lots of genes, a sophisticated program for fighting off the immune system, that's one way retroviruses have evolved. There are also brutally simple retroviruses that have three genes, and they're just these little things. Um, uh, leading to some debate about, you know, which came first. Was it in DNA and became a transposon and became a virus, or was it a virus that got put in DNA? But for these herbs, we're pretty darn sure that these came in as viruses and got incorporated. And the the envelope gene in particular, this antigen that goes on the surface, turns out to sometimes be useful because it's a it's a protein that can display on the cell surface and can potentially interact with other proteins on the cell. According to this the introduction, they say uh, 80, over 80 retroviral envelopes have been co-opted in vertebrates, including 18 in humans. And one of them is syncytion and there are others uh, as well. And um, most of these are, uh, many of these are, are cell uh, transport proteins or receptors uh, and um, involved in metabolism. So, um, that's what we're going to look at here is the involvement of one of these endogenous envelope. Right. So one of the one of the obvious things you could do with a stolen uh, envelope gene is use it to compete with the receptor right. for that virus and prevent that virus from infecting you again. Exactly. So that's a restriction activity that's very commonly associated with these. And then there are things like syncytion, um, where you've got this envelope gene sticking out and you can use it to form a syncytium to make a placenta and take over the world with your, you know, placental mammal mm-hmm. advance that you've made. I remember um, we had a, we talked about a really cool paper about one that I think was in invertebrates, but that allowed like gamete fusion. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So these, these are used for a variety of things. I, this is the first time what we're going to talk about here where I've heard of one that's being used for just like a routine day-to-day metabolic cellular basic function. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the, sort of the selling point of this paper. Yeah. It, this it's is kind of why it's in function. cell, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. So the sort of the common, uh, I'm just, you already kind of said this, Alan, but I'm 
slow to wake up here. Sort of the common minimal herb is sort of gag pull in, right? Caps right. of protein, polymerase gene, envelope, uh, and uh, with varying degrees of degradation of all of those uh, genes to the point of hard even to recognize. Are there examples of gag or env being co-opted? Env, env I'm is sorry, the one that's I'm most... Not, I'm, I'm Paul. I'm not... Gag I'm being co-opted. I don't know. Or is it always just env? Well, I mean, I don't think that you'd want to have Paul co-opted. Well, right, we already, we already the, have Paul. The, we um, already have our transcriptase, yeah. <laughs> we have RTs already. Um, yeah, I mean, that give you RT or integrase. But gag, yeah. um, arc looks like a gag, oh, right? Arc, yeah. the, okay. the, the neuro... Um, what, what would I, the, it's the, a, the neurotransmitter one. Neurotransmitter, Jason Shepard. Uh, yeah believes it's a neurotransmitter. It's a capsid made by gag that he thinks packages things and they, they moves it throughout the CNS. That's okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, that's so, familiar. But most of the examples we know so far are co-option of env genes. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. Most of them are envelope genes. All right, so what about cats? Meow. Yeah. Two, <laughs> two kinds of herbs, and these make a truncated envelope with just the receptor binding domain and they're called Felix ah I love <laughs> yes it. and and reflex one that's not as good that's the that's one that's not we're as good mostly Felix is a great Felix is great Felix, is, uh, Felix <laughs> is related to the feline leukemia virus endogenous envelope and um, it binds a phosphate transporter Okay, so Felix binds at phosphate transporter. So the virus that has this envelope, the receptor for the virus is a phosphate transporter. On the other, on the other hand, Reflex one is related to another family of uh, domestic cat <laughs> endogenous retroviruses. Um, it is a restriction factor, which prevents infection with. DC herbs, okay, a certain kind of retrovirus. So as, as Alan said, these uh, endogenous envelopes can prevent superinfection with other viruses. So they're antiviral. We call those restriction factors. Um, these uh, DC7 and 16, so those are the ones that make a virus that reflex uh, interferes with. They're found in domestic cats and European wild cats, and they're actively transcribed, so they make mRNA. So it looks like this Reflex 1 has been evolutionarily conserved uh, in cats. Otherwise, so, probably wouldn't be transcribed, right? Yeah, so this, this virus seems kind of, this viral protein seems kind of useful in yeah. the cats. So what we've, so uh, uh, even, it's not uncommon, you know, viruses use all sorts of cell surface proteins to infect. Yeah. Okay, the cell surface proteins aren't necessarily there, aren't there. To attract viruses. Yeah. The viruses find ways to get in by binding to cell surface proteins and uh, retroviruses can, you know, bind a bunch of different things, including stuff like uh, metabolic transporters of one sort or another. And so there's out there somewhere sometime there was a retrovirus that used this particular transporter. And um, uh, this works as a restriction factor by making something that looks like the same envelope protein, probably derived from a similar or same envelope protein at some point, and binds the same cell surface transporter, and I presume blocks infection, sterically. That's right. Uh, somehow, yeah. of theoretically, of something that might come along that looks like the original retrovirus. Right. But that, of course, means that this protein is also binding to this metabolic transporter. Yes. Right. So, and could potentially be affecting its activity. Right. So does it do anything other Right. So with Reflex One, um, this group and apparently their competitors um, figured out that re that um, it's the the CTR one mm. is the receptor for right. Reflex One. Right. And those viruses that have Reflex One. Right. Yeah. Right. And so in this paper, they wanted to know if that has some physiological. Does that do or, anything? Does it do besides anything aside from uh, yeah. blocking infection or facilitating infection? Does it do anything? All right, so uh, Reflex 1 is a soluble protein, and you can find it in the culture media of cat cell lines. <laughs> and cat cell lines are very cute. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they look like any other cells, but you know. yeah. <laughs> but you can scan them. Oh, yep. give me a break, that one. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so they look to see if um, the, these these endogenous retroviruses are of DC seven and sixteen, the ones that bind uh, CTR one. Reflex one, sorry, reflex one binds CTR one if they're present in these cells, um, and um, they find them in a cat primary cat peripheral blood mono, mononuclear cells. So the the cats are okay; they just take a little blood. You can do that with cats; it's okay. And then they want a hard time doing it with my cat. I'll tell yeah, you. Yeah, I was going to yeah, say yeah, it's not it's not easily do done with do many cats. cats. One can do it. So, One can get a veterinarian to do it. <laughs> so then they say, what if we turn off Reflex 1? Right? Remember, Reflex 1 is the uh, soluble um, receptor binding domain of this particular herb, right? And they say, well, well, what if we silence it? Let's see what happens. So when you silence it, and they confirm that it's silenced, which means the protein is, is knocked down in the cells. They, when they try infecting these cells with... Um, pseudotype viruses with the right envelope um, to uh, to infect these cells, they find that uh, you get increased infectivity. In other words, somehow Reflex 1 is keeping infection down. And if you knock down F Reflex 1, you can, you can more readily infect the cells. And the idea here is, as we've already mentioned, that Reflex 1 is binding to... Um, what is the name of the damn copper thing? CTR1. CTR. <laughs> and then the virus can't bind CTR to get in, right? It's interfering with its yep. binding. So if you knock down reflex, now the, the receptor is available to be infected. So now the cat's cells are, and potentially the cats, are protected from whatever this mystery past virus is right. that included this protein. Yeah, so I, I want to make sure I uh, uh, understand something or make it clear here. The virus that they're challenging these cells with is like a totally fake virus. It's totally it's fake. It's a fake virus and because so, the real virus doesn't seem to exist yeah, anymore. It's an imposter. Okay. It's an Funny. imposter. Right. So, yeah. and, and it's even faker than that because it's got, I, don't, I didn't even look because it's got a VSV uh, backbone. It's a lenti. Uh, it's a lenti virus. It's a lenti virus. Yeah. Okay. So it is a, it is a, a retro type uh, virus, innocuous. Okay. But has substituted into it this envelope gene from something from millions of years ago okay that we think was the progenitor of this herb so it's right totally fake but who knows could show up somewhere in the future as well but it so binds be it binds ctr1 right and that's right. blocked by yeah. reflex one so they're both binding Hap yeah to and happily if this virus decides to time travel our cats are protected against it. Yes, the cats cool. are still protected. Yeah. They have because their cells are making reflex ones. Right. They they're can doing really hold a grudge. They're yeah. doing the sort of proactive <laughs> pandemic stuff that we ought to be doing. <laughs> now you may say, why? What's the function of this bill? If a cell is infected with a retrovirus, uh, it's not in its best interest to have another virus come in and take away resources. So many retroviruses throw up no they don't throw up sorry <laughs> that's that's just jargon many cats throw up they produce but... uh envelopes that go to the surface and block receptors that uh another virus would use or the same virus would use so that it it remains the sole uh king of that cell or queen of yeah, that the last cell. one in closes the gate last yeah. one in closes the gate all right but now when they did this knockdown experiment they noticed the cells uh, didn't look good they were no yeah. longer cute like and this is this is a case where I think often I'm reading a paper and I'm like, okay, this is a well crafted story. It's not the order in which they did the experiments. This is you know they put them together in the order they should have done the experiments. Now knowing what what the outcome was in this paper, it seems like and I could be wrong, but it seems like they probably did do it in this order. Yeah, because they're they're looking at well, okay, is this a restriction factor? And oh yeah, it is a restriction factor. Wait a second. The cells look really sick yeah. when we knock that down. Yeah, right. Which doesn't make any sense if this is a restriction factor for an extinct retrovirus that infected cats millions of years ago. Why do the cells apparently care so much when you knock it down? Yeah. 
so um, th- this is also, <laughs> it, it emphasizes something that Petra Levin always says, you know, when you, when you do something, you should always look at your cells. <laughs> Yeah, I'm imagining yeah. myself doing the same thing because you're always checking the cells. Make sure what yeah. they look mm-hmm. like. She said, in be, particular, if you're used to doing virology, virology, we you're always, always looking, looking for cells. cytopathic yeah. effect, right? So, so in her case, she said people do things to bacteria and they never look at the cells. And I can see that, you know, you have to smoosh them on a slide and look them under. But for us, it's easy. You put the plate on our microscope and you look them because so we have these inverted cell culture microscopes. Anyway, they, they noticed that the cells uh, were dying. So uh, it, it turns out that um, so you can introduce envelope from one of these ancient retroviruses, DC sixteen, into these cells, and it it, um, it rescues them from dying; they survive. So somehow uh, the idea is that this um, uh, other vector is you've knocked it down, and now when basically you put a related protein in, and the cells are living. Okay. So the protein does something useful for the cell. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they do a number of studies to ask what kind of cell death this is. Basically, there's a protein called the Nexin 5, and this is a marker for apoptosis. They can see that um, that they're positive, and then they conclude that when you knock down reflex, reflex 1, the cells undergo apoptosis. They decide that life is just not worth yeah. living without that protein. So the protein is protecting the cells from apoptosis, all right? All right, so reflex one is basically a part of envelope. It can interfere with the, these old ancient retroviruses from infecting cells. And so they're thinking, all right, so the binding must have something to do with uh, preventing cell death, but does it, re- does it recognize anything else? So they set up a, a flow cytometry assay to ask uh, if uh, there are any other uh, receptors for reflex one besides um, CTR. And in this cyto- this flow cytometry assay, they can see for sure that cells that produce CTR1 bind reflex one. Uh, but if you take cells without CTR1, you can edit it out, edit out the gene, reflex one no longer binds. So it apparently is the only um, receptor for uh, CTR1 is the only receptor for reflex one. I'm I'm pausing here because they did this with human cells. Right. And they did that because you can downmodulate CTR1 on human cells with copper by right? exposing them to a high dose of copper. Yeah. And that's the way human cells prevent themselves from taking in too much copper. So remember we said you have to have you have to have homeostasis, you have to have the right amount of copper. Yeah. You need some, but not too much. So if you give a high dose of copper to human cells, they'll shut down CTR1 by pulling it in off the membrane. And so yeah, that's- I'm just wondering though, it could be different in cats, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they use the, they put the cat CTR1 into a cell, into a hamster cell line um, to show binding of cat CTR1, but they don't actually look in yeah. cat cells themselves. Right. It, it, I think we're going to see in a moment why- they're not knocking out CTR1 in cat cells, right? Yeah. Okay. So then they ask, can reflex one alter copper transport? So they put reflex one in, in these uh, human cells, 293T cells. Uh, and um, it, it confers uh, resistance to infection by these ancient herbs, as we talked about. Uh, and then they measure... So the protein is there, it's functional. Then they measure intracellular copper by mass spec. Uh, And they find that with reflex one, they have reduced copper levels. If they silence reflex one with siRNAs, uh, copper goes up, suggesting that somehow reflex one is modulating copper transport through uh, CTR1. But it's, and, and this, um, is not by downregulating CTR1 or degrading it, because that's that's what happens in human cells. Um, it is uh, it is by um, the the reflex one binding to CTR1 on the cell surface. And in fact, when you um, 
when you silence reflex one, you get copper accumulation. And then there's a whole bunch of other genes whose gene products are involved in copper homeostasis. So there's not just um, CTR1. The, the transcription of those genes change as well as you would expect when copper gets into the cell. All right, so you... And so potentially those cells, you know, were dying from copper toxicity. That's right, that's right. Okay, so CTR1, it's blocked by reflex one, and that seems to block copper transport uh, into the cell. Now, human cells, as we just said, you, you give them copper and they can reduce CTR1 at the plasma membrane so that you don't get too much into cells, too much copper taken up, right? So a lot of copper somehow is down-regulating CTR1 uh, at, the, at the cell membrane. But they, they tried to see if in cat cells the same thing happens, uh, but they don't see such uh, down-regulation. If they, they add copper, the, the same amount of CTR1 remains uh, on the cell surface. But yeah, and if you if you add copper and take away reflex one, the cells die from copper toxicity. That's right. With the same amount of CTR one on the on the cell membrane, right. so the the thing that they could do, they apparently can't. And so, what happens instead of downregulating CTR one when you add copper to cat cells, you, the levels of these reflex one mRNAs go up when you add copper. And so that makes sense, right? Because now you're adding copper and the cell is saying, oh, no, no, not too much, not too much. It puts, puts out some reflex one, which is going to bind the transporter and modulate the amount of copper that, that gets in. So the, uh, the effect of copper on CTR1 is different in human cells and in cat cells. We always know that cats and humans are different, right? Yes. And now this shows it with copper <laughs> because in human cells, CTR1 is taken away from the plasma membrane, so it can't bring in copper. But in cat cells, Copper upregulates, turns on reflex one production and binds. And of course, humans don't have this endogenous feline retrovirus, right? So they can't, they have to do something different, I guess. Right? Yeah. So, so I get, so in theory, we evolved some way, some other way to regulate copper, and cats didn't have to because they got infected by this virus. <laughs> or perhaps, yes. perhaps the pre virus cats were just living a sad copper toxic life. <laughs> and only after this infection entered their population did they suddenly have this ability to regulate. That's a really but good it raises question. an interesting evolutionary question yeah, yeah, yeah. because when I mean we're mammals so are cats yeah. and at some point early early in evolution we had to have ways of dealing with copper and those ways changed over time and at some point the carnivore line and the human line diverged in this very, very fundamental physiological aspect of how we deal with copper. And it, yeah. I think it would be cool to kind of trace back Reflex's origin and see, is this a general thing in carnivores or is it how far back in the family yeah. treated that branch yeah. point? That ought, to be not to, that ought to be relatively straightforward, yeah. right? Yeah, that you should be able to search for this in this genome databases. Gene, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it could be that there were other less efficient mechanisms of modulating copper, right? And then suddenly this this retrovirus came in and it was better, right? Right. So it took over over many years of evolution. I, these kinds of questions are always interesting to think about, right? How the sequence yes. of what, what happened and... Yeah, this may have happened in an animal that is not like Felix. Yes. Right? Be interesting to know, you know, when it came about. Yeah, I would definitely. I I definitely now want to now want to know about reflex like genes in yeah. cat relatives. Right. Yeah. yeah, you know they talk about wild cats have some of these, right? Right. And as well as domestic. But what about great cats? Uh, you know, right. You know, some of this uh -huh. could be in some of their earlier papers because they've been working on this for a yeah. while. Right. Anyway, then they kind of tie this together by showing that um, um, they have a, a copper chelator. Um, which they can use that will prevent apoptosis when you uh, silence reflex one. Remember that it's the reflex one is normally plugging CTR one. Copper can't get in. You silence reflex one. Copper goes in. They have a copper key and copper goes in. You get apoptosis. Program cell death. If they have a copper chelator, bethocuproindisulfonic acid (BCS). 
uh, then that reverses the apoptosis, even with reflex one knocked down. So kind of proves that uh, reflex is present preventing uh, apoptosis. Uh, and then finally, they go back to cats. So, so far we've got reflex in the cell culture medium of cat cells. Uh, it's not in all cat tissues, interestingly, but there is some evidence that's in cat serum. So serum would be useful to have it in serum. It could protect a lot of cells, obviously. So the, they look at this, they ask, is reflex one in the cat serum by, they get some cat sera and they ask if it protects cells against infection with these uh, ancient retroviruses. And it does, and it does so in a, in a dose dependent manner. So it seems to be in serum and they don't have antibodies, I guess. So <laughs> they can't just <laughs> do a Western blotter or something like that. And they complain actually later that they don't. Yeah. They talk, they talk about this in limitations. Yeah. Um, there, there's a section that's basically our tools suck um, that says, you know, we we don't have good antibodies against these things. We don't. The cell lines are limited. The tools for working on um, cat cells are just much more limited than they are for human or mouse. So, in all of these uh, uh, cell sorting experiments, where they're probing uh, the cat gene products, are we looking at RNAs? I'm I'm I've been thinking about this. I'm a little confused because where we're looking to see, you know, uh, using um, bang, SIRNA. stumbling on my words the, here. The siRNA, the silencing. Well, yeah. So like, so they must have some antibodies that work. Well, they do a bunch of things with H flag tags. Yeah, they tag things. Oh, expression. yeah, that's, ah, right. that's right. That's right. Okay, yeah. flag tags. They put, so. they put okay. tags yeah. on, yeah. Right. Okay, good. So, okay, so they think it's in serum reflex one. Um, it is, um, they, they get freshly, freshly isolated cat red blood cells, um, but the virus, that retrovirus cannot bind to them, and they think it's probably because there's, Reflex one binding to cat one uh, on on the um, CTR one. Sorry, I, I automatically called it cat one. <laughs> cat one. Yes. CTR one on the red blood cells. They also look for uh, the presence of the protein in cat PBMCs. They isolate from three domestic cat donors. <laughs> so no cats were harmed in this. They just get some blood, get PBMCs. They incubate them with copper these PBMCs. Uh, without copper, they see variable reflex expression, and it's increased in the presence of copper in two or three cats. So the cats vary in their response to uh, reflex. They conclude that copper sensing exists in vivo, that is in the cat, in the living cat, and that PBMCs may uh, be able to uh, adapt reflex expression in response to copper variation in cat blood. So figure seven. And that one is is mRNA rich. Yeah. So that's yeah. got to be yes. mRNA because we don't have antibodies. Yeah. I'm thinking referencing our earlier quip that uh, they got the human serum from the people who bled the cats <laughs> automatically. <laughs> right. Yes. Yes. So that's uh, that's a story, though. So there is a copper transporter in feline cells. It's essential for maintaining copper homeostasis, and it's regulated by a soluble uh, envelope, part of an envelope protein from an ancient retroviral infection. So this is important to the cat, presumably, right? We didn't do any experiments in cats because we don't want to harm cats. We don't want to not cat right. and so forth. But, uh -huh. you know, it's funny. Um. Uh, when I when I interviewed uh, Gary Whitaker at Cornell, he works on coronaviruses and uh, also uh, feline infectious peritonitis viruses. And he says he does not do experiments on cats. He refuses. To, he doesn't want to harm them. You know, he says if if a cat dies somewhere because of FIP or or the other disease, he will get parts of the cat and study them. But he doesn't want to harm cats. So that's pretty interesting. I I would also not want to harm cats, but I have to say, I think the cats would also refuse. Yes. They wouldn't sign <laughs> consent, right? They wouldn't no. sign consent. No. They wouldn't sign consent. 
Cats are unique uh, entities. They certainly are. Okay, that's the story. Very cool. And now we, so now, uh, you know, we have syncytion in humans allowing a placenta to be made. And now we have in cats. Um, allowing cats to be made. Allowing cats to survive <laughs> and not have too much <laughs> copper. Um, there, there was a play. This is, this is a very interesting. A few weeks ago, I was supposed to go to, um, in, to Salt Lake City. It was a retrovirus meeting there. And um, during this retrovirus meeting, they were, they were going to read a play that had been written, a science fiction play that had been written by a playwright and um, it was going to be performed by several. It was a reading, basically. Uh, but, oh, I don't, I don't know what the title of it. I have, the, I have the program from it. I never ended up getting there because my flight was canceled. The idea, I was going to do a twiv with some of the actors and the playwright and the director and so forth to talk about why they did this. But basically, the, the, the theory was, or the thesis of the play was, someone knocked out syncytion in humans. Okay, so now humans lay eggs. And quick evolution after a knockout. I, you yes. know, that's science fiction, right? But uh, yeah. this, and, and so it's a very specific situation where, you know, this young lady, her eggs are incubating, right? That she laid, she, they're in an incubator, a warm incubator, and someone breaks them all. Oh. So it's an interesting, right? Because now it's very easy to destroy someone's right. Uh, embryos, right? So what are the implications of that? You know, you get somebody mad at you. Well, your your partner who you made the- uh, the, They break up your nest. Yeah. Really interesting, right? (laughs) So anyway, (laughs) we're going to try and get them on TWIV at some point to uh, to talk about why they did this and and everything. But I think it's really interesting, right? Cool. What's- Pretty sure the overturning of Roe v. Wade was a significant factor in there. You think? Yeah. Uh, let's see, do, let's do a couple of email here. Um, first one, um, since Rich mentioned this, I think you should take that first one. <laughs> Lorian writes, if you plan to take your mouse to the opera, I would suggest deflator mouse rather than deflator mouse. Uh, I'm, uh, this confuses me. Uh, uh, let me finish your email. I have no idea what the latter is, deflator mouse but I'm sure it's not nearly as entertaining as the real thing. <laughs> sorry, my ex, my area of expertise. So uh, this, for me, I'm sorry, is a mysterious email. Maybe you guys can... Oh, have Alan is the one who said de- Derfleeter Mouse. Was that you? No, I don't think I did. I, I know it's Deflater Mouse. Yeah, you, I mean, typically, think... you know, in uh, in German, uh, uh, Der, D Das, right? Our masculine, feminine, uh, uh, neuter, neutral... Uh, gender articles. Okay. okay. So, and a flater mouse, I looked it up, is a bat. Yes. Okay. It's a flying mouse. It's a, a flying, flying mouse. mouse. So, okay. I, I, maybe Dixon and said it. Uh, uh, and it's the feminine gender, D. Mm. Uh, and I, okay. So, maybe somebody said der flater mouse. Yeah, I think Dixon, I think Dixon said der flater mouse because uh, okay. mouse, he was making a joke because, you know, take your yeah. mouse right. to the opera. And he said, yeah, but you would take them to see Der Flater Mouse. <laughs> and that's and, it. Uh, uh, does anybody know anything about this opera? I've never seen it. No. Uh, is it it has some pretty famous music. Can you hum it? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's Strauss. Okay. Um, so this is... You know is... the music. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, uh, so let's play the the deflator mouse overture. Yeah, it's a like, dun 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 dun. <laughs> did you hear that? Okay. You probably didn't hear it, but we, no, I didn't hear, did it. hear it. Yeah, I don't have it set up because you, then you would hear yourself and you would get feedback. Right. But here, I'm going to do this. Hold on. I'm going to show that I am capable of technological. Uh, what, what do you call wizardry. it? Wizardry. No, no wizardry. When you do something in a play and it's really good, what do you call that? Wizardry? <laughs> oh, no. Ozio. Something Ozio. What is it? Um, uh, I, I can't do it. Anyway, here, this is going to work. Now, don't say anything, any of you guys, because then you get a uh, um, a feedback, okay? 
Uh, this should work. This, yeah, I gotta take it off now. Hang on. Take it off. Come on, take it off. Now that I've put the damn thing there, it won't go away. How bad is the echo? The echo. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah, that's a problem. Why doesn't it go away? So I basically just moved a an audio chain, you know. Or maybe I have to do control. Oh. There it goes. Now you can talk. Okay. Uh, I just moved an audio chain, but that's pretty famous, that, right? It is. It is. Uh, so it is a farce. Have, have <laughs> yes. any of you ever seen this? No, I've never seen no. it. I have not. Okay. Uh, okay. Al Alan, you're good at, at summarizing, so you take the next one. Please. Sure. Uh, John writes, Vincent of the TWIV team, I have to say you're all amazing. I have now listened to every TWIV, some more than once, and your insights and comments were always enlightening passion all of you have for the show's content, whether it be virology, immunology, or biochemistry, is infectious. Then apologizes for the pun, which of course you don't have to do around here. Um, <laughs> over the last few months, concept of truth has come up on many episodes, RFK, flu vaccines, etc. Um, in my lab, we spent a great deal of time mapping and analyzing the spread of infectious diseases and trying to understand geospatial reasons for their movement. We're currently working with the data from the 2013 to 16 Ebola outbreak in West Africa. What became obvious very quickly to us, at least in this example, is the difference between the recommendations of science and deeply held cultural beliefs and practices, which, while not explicitly in conflict with the science, inform behaviors at odds with public health recommendations. Um, talks about deeply held customs, especially kinship structures and funeral rites. Um, in these regions often supersede in people's minds recommendations from outside their cultural context. In most cases, these obligations are considered inescapable. And an interesting paper provides a paper, Social Pathways for Ebola Virus Disease in Rural Sierra Leone, um, and um, provides the abstract for that. The article goes into some detail about marriage rituals and how the death of a spouse compelled travel in many cases not to a funeral, but for economic and status reasons, which in the minds of most, the data are very clear on this, rural residents of Sierra Leone far outweighed the dangers of Ebola transmission during the outbreak. No direct denial of science, just trusted and long-standing customs being considered more important than the risk of death or transmission. This is all just to say the cult that culture is an important consideration when thinking about what informs people's actions, and what counts as rational is a culturally informed concept. Uh, Staff Pick is a new volume from the University of Pennsylvania Press called On Pestilence. It's a translation of lectures given by Ger uh, Gerolom Ger Gerolamo Mercuriale in Venice in 1577. In 1576, the Public Health Office of Venice imposed a quarantine on the city because of a plague outbreak. Uh, Mercuriale misdiagnosed the plague and suggested opening up the city, especially for economic reasons. By July, 50,000 Venetians had died of the plague. Uh, the book is his lectures on plague and public health policy after he recognized his tragic mistake. The lectures are surprisingly modern and show how some of the same public health issues Problems like economics and politics entering into public health discussions have been with us for centuries. Mm. Thanks for all you do and for reading this way too long email. That's uh, really you, very cool. That's a good point. I, I'm like glad to hear that because I would assume it's only recent, right? <laughs> I, uh, yeah, but I mean, this this idea of inescapable social obligations, I think yeah. most people can probably relate to, I know. right? You've got- sure. In, it, it happens to be a particular type of op obligation in rural Sierra, Sierra Leone when a loved one dies, but when a loved one dies in the United States or in England or Germany or Japan, you've got other obligations that are, you know, you got to do these things. You got to go to the funeral. You got to, you know, do what's expected. And if somebody says, well, you're risking your health, it's like, well, Okay, so I'm risking my health. Yeah. And it's not necessarily science denial. 
Well, you know, it's like that was one of the really squishiest, trickiest parts of the whole pandemic was yeah. the, the fact of the pandemic bumping up against the economy, politics, and culture uh, and trying to balance those to, to do the right thing. And there was no, I don't think there was any really obvious solution. Okay. Uh, and, uh, hardly anybody got it right. How did it, I was having this conversation with somebody the other day. How did it work out in New Zealand? I mean, what you really, what the, the ideal thing, right. Would be to isolate yourself until everybody was vaccinated. Right. Right. And right. then let it in. New Zealand has a, they have an advantage cause they're an Island. All right. With only 5 million people. Okay. So potentially you could do that. I don't know quite how it worked there. I do know that they had their share of outbreaks, but they uh, did. But as I recall, it went about as well as you could possibly imagine it going. Um, right. I mean, yeah, it, it's, it wasn't going to be perfect, but globally, but they, I think we tried all different combinations yeah. of, of things. Uh, and there were, there was no uh, you, right answer. There was yeah. no right answer, but there were some that were very clearly and obviously wrong and that we knew were wrong going into it and that should not have been done that way. Right. Well, and I think that a lot of us can think back to some of the holidays, say at the end of 2020 yes. or something like that, and how making decisions of when do you see family members and when is it, what is the criteria for going to do things versus not? And, you know, well, what if your family wants you to come, even if you want to protect that family member kind of thing? Like, this is tricky in everywhere, not just rural Sierra Leone. What um, if What if you yeah. expect this is going to be grandma's last Thanksgiving? Yeah. Exactly. Good point. Yeah. Rianne, can you take the next one? Sure. Suzanne writes, does a virus's origin affect its epidemiology? I can think of no way this would affect what we know about SARS-CoV-2 at this point. But I also know this person isn't going to listen to me because I have no training in virology whatsoever. So I figured I'd share this question for you, uh, with you. And uh, she provides a link. Uh, and so it says, uh, question for the epidemiology crowd. Setting politics aside, what impact, if any, does the origin of the COVID-19 pandemic have on the course of this disease? For example, if the pandemic was caused by a lab-modified coronavirus, would th this have implications for the virus's evolutionary course? For the purposes of predicting epidemiological outcomes, do initial conditions matter in this context? Um, if there are peer-reviewed papers on this, I should read on this, a nose point would be great. And then the person who wrote the post, um, this is a Mastodon post, uh, continues, to be clear, I'm not interested in wading into a zoonotic origin versus lab leak debate on SARS-CoV-2. That way lies misery. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm only interested in knowing whether zoonotic versus lab matters from an epidemiological point of view. Put another way, is this particular coronavirus's propensity for mutation at odds with others in this family? If so, how is this explained? How does this mutational propensity factor into predictions about what living with SARS-CoV-2 will look like five years from now? I'd love to hear that it makes no difference whatsoever that this virus is happily mutating away on its own. But if so, I'd like to know how we know this to be so. Big ask, I know, but I think it's a question worth posing to Fed's epidemiology experts. Um, I don't think that the origin of the virus really matters at all in this context. And um, yeah, I would agree. We are seeing this virus mutate the way that it mutates and the way that we might expect it to. Mutate. And, yeah. And the way other human coronaviruses mutate. Right. Yeah. If you were, it is, it is behaving exactly. I'm sorry. I know you don't like the term behaving for a virus, right. Vincent, okay. but um, it is, it is doing exactly what we expect a common cold coronavirus to do in the course of its crossover of its spillover into humans and its subsequent evolution. It is mutating at exactly the rate we expect it to for that kind of thing. And, you know, if it was made in a lab, it sure is acting like all the other coronaviruses. So no, this has no epidemiological difference. Yeah, if you were skilled enough to be able to make something that was so good at <laughs> transmitting initially, right, it would just be like spilling over from a bat. Yeah. And yeah. So the person said, how do we know this? Because this is the way viruses are. 
they, especially the coronaviruses, can recombine. We know that this is happening. They can undergo antigenic variation and so forth. Um, yeah, it, it's as everyone has said, it's doing exactly what a virus does. So, and and in fact, the only thing I would say is, if you made a crappy virus, it would never get this far. <laughs> Yeah, yes. I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm thinking that I'm thinking that from an epidemiological point of view, if we just totally hypothetical thing, comparing spillover from a lab, uh, spillover uh, mm -hmm. uh, event with a lab origin. Okay, so the I'm thinking about when it gets into humans. What's the genetic sort of set point? Mm -hmm. Okay. What does this genome look like at that point, and how might that impact on its evolution? I'm imagining that if you tried to create something in a laboratory uh, and stuck it in the environment, it would spend a significant period of time trying to sort itself out so that it could actually spread properly in humans, okay? Uh, and then it would probably reach an, uh, a, an equilibrium or a set yeah. point that didn't yeah. look a whole hell of a lot different than a, than a, uh, uh, than a spillover and evolve from there. Or it would just fall flat on its face. Yeah, that was the other yeah, thing. That's the more yeah, logical. That's, is yeah. that we could make it and then we would not They'd know. Never all the see it we again. Know. Yeah. And of course, we have no data. Right. On... This is a totally storytelling. <laughs> right. Totally storytelling. It's uh, and there's absolutely no reason to believe right. that it came from a lab right. because it's doing exactly what an animal spillover coronavirus right. would do. I'm trying to think of any example we could use, but you know, even the 1977 H1N1 pandemic, that <clears throat> that virus was virtually identical to a virus that had been circulating in the 1950s. And the idea was it was being used in a vaccine trial <clears throat> in the 70s and uh, it started to spread from person to person and uh, it got out. But that's a natural virus. That's that wasn't made in a lab. No. It was held in a lab. It was held in a lab, it was in a freezer and then accidentally exactly. sent out again. Yeah. So we have no Yeah. But the thing is there are probably countless examples of spillovers that never go anywhere, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, we talked about one the other day, right? The H three N eight flu. Yeah. Right? That killed yeah. a couple of people. Yeah. Hasn't and gone we anywhere. we talked about yeah. how, you know, this kind of stuff is going on all the time. Yeah. So um, we can't study those because <laughs> there's not enough signal. Right. But yeah. they could be instructive. But I think HCN8 is instructive because it doesn't have what it takes, clearly. So what does it take? Who knows? Something else in the genome. And if it ever got that, then we'd be able to compare them. But we just don't know. It's a it's a really interesting question, actually. Um you know, which we've answered to the best of our abilities, um, but we can't really give you <laughs> more than that. Okay. But the answer to the question posed in this toot is, I think this is what they're called on Mastodon, um, <laughs> is... Uh, Seriously? Right? Am I, I, don't I don't know. I don't go yeah, there. I think they're That's called toots good, instead of tweets. <laughs> um <laughs> Which, you know, sounds appropriate for just posting things on social media. Uh, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, I think the answer is no. This wouldn't, there's no difference right. in wouldn't terms of public health for it, it, what the origin would do. Is that is uh, anyone on Mastodon? Did you ever grow Brienne? I did not. No. Uh, I heard, I've talked to some friends. They told me pros and cons. I might go to Blue Sky. Blue but, Sky, what is that? It's another one of the competitor. Um, it's started by some other group of billionaires and is probably, you know, susceptible to the same types of problems. Probably. But, they, but currently, apparently, some people are fans. Yes. Blue Ski, I would say, not Blue Ski, but it said Blue Sky, Blue right? What, what is yeah. it? I'm sure it's Blue Sky. Uh. It, it's another social media platform that people say has a much better user interface uh, and it's much the more problem is the users are still human and they're going to mess it up. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, I found the ideal user interface for me is that I'm just not on social media yeah. anymore. <laughs> well, you know. It's great. It's just, yeah. it, it's wonderful. All right. Well. And for me, social social media interface is, you know, getting together with somebody and, and talking, going out somewhere. Oh, that's talking. Novel. Yeah. All right, last one from Charles. Hello, Twivers. ADF, sunny Chapel Hill today. I listened to Twiv's 
10.44 and 45 while driving back from New Jersey yesterday. The last letters from 10.45, or is that 02025? And I guess that's base 10 or binary or one of those things. We, we, well, base 10 would be 10.45, I don't, I, 02025. Base 8, it's one of those. He, he explained it in, in a separate email. Okay. Although I may not have read it. It reminded me of another virus hunting program. So remember, there's one, the one the U.S. recently canceled. Um, oh, right. The USAID yeah. uh, did, did. Project Argus from Georgetown University was also canceled a few years ago and was handcuffed before that. Project Argus, the many-eyed and, in this case, many-eared creature, looked at news sources around the world for signs of epidemics. It gathered from sources in 34 to 50 languages. It was a cheap way to get an early indication of what was happening in the world without having to rely on official channels. It had real world success. I wish it would start up again and be allowed to look at all public sources. And Charles gives really interesting. a bunch of links. Now, hmm. I don't see why they would can it because this is, you know, the other one, they said, oh, it's too dangerous to sample, which is, I don't agree. Okay, fine. But this one, what's the danger here? You know, remember Google flu? Yeah. 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 That worked, right? It, well, it did until it didn't. <laughs> for certain definitions of yeah. worked. Yeah. For for tech optimists, but no, it didn't really. Well, I mean, didn't it give you a forewarning when people went and bought uh, over-the-counter stuff? Yeah, right? but it also gave you a forewarning when there wasn't an elevated flu level. Right. So, yeah. But they could they could optimize but this, the, uh, the this algorithm. This is potentially a better approach to it, scanning all the public news sources. Yeah, but that's going to be a little bit delayed. No, I think we should just scan the wastewater. Yes. That's probably the best. And uh, Charles gives a couple of links. Okay. Time for some picks of the week. Too bad Dixon's not here. He had an interesting story. But Brianne, what do you have for us? Um, I have an article that I read recently um, from CNN about uh, our favorite James Webb telescope. Um, so people took a look at some data from uh, Webb looking at Jupiter's moon Europa. Um, Europa is known to have water or at least frozen water. Um, and so that's one of the first things, of course, needed for life. Um, but then the next thing of that, at least based on the life we know, is that you need some carbon. Um, or carbon-containing compounds. Um, and so um, the Webb telescope uh, now has found a bunch of CO2 that seems to be in the ocean um, and sort of shows kind of the next steps of um, possible uh, chem chemistry of life there. Uh, and so I thought that was pretty cool. Excellent. And in our own solar system. Yeah, it's cool. Building block of life. <laughs> All right. Rich, what do you have for us? Uh, we're on the same track here, Brianne. I think, <laughs> uh, and I forget why I uh, looked this up, uh, but it's this, there's a sort of a, a collision uh, of the James Webb Telescope. Oh, and I read, I read the Oppenheimer book. Okay, so that got me thinking about fission. It also got me thinking about fusion because of the H-bomb and the James Webb Telescope about the origins of the universe and this notion that the old Carl Sagan uh, 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 quote of we are made of star stuff. And I said, I want to kind of put all this together. What hmm. was there in the beginning and where did all the more complicated stuff come from? So I you know, uh, looked around and found this delightful seven minute long YouTube from some sort of, you know, astrophysics uh, uh, person uh, that I guess makes a number of episodes that starts off with Carl Sagan's quote and talks about the Big Bang and what was there in the beginning of the universe uh, and about the life cycle of a star and how uh, uh, when stars die, uh, they uh, get uh, really uh, dense and the lighter elements combine to make heavier elements that ultimately get spewed out into space. And here we are. So it's a really, it, it really nicely puts the big bang, the origin of the universe and, uh, the sort of, uh, uh, origins of the molecules of life in a, in a nice 
tidy package. It's very nice. Cool. Nice. You like space, don't you? I do. And, uh, you know, the, <laughs> the, the, I, uh, uh, we had, I don't know if we were on the air or not when Dixon reminded me of his documentary on the James Webb, uh, telescope that I had mm-hmm. not looked at, uh, when we were on the last episode that I went and looked at and that got me, uh, all steamed up again as well. I, you know, <sighs> space is cool. Space yeah, is really space is cool. cool. Hey, and it's really big. It, I agree. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> but I think viruses are cool too. <laughs> yes. And they're really small. Do you think they're yeah, viruses they're in really... space? Yeah. Somewhere. Yeah. If there's something alive out there, there are viruses. Uh, there's got to be. Why has it got to be? You know? Why? Why? <clears throat> I just, it's. Why? Give we, me you math. Know, because. Math. Math. <laughs> math. Yeah. <laughs> big. Right. And it's wishful too, thinking. It's too big. We can't be the only. So we're never going to know this. Around. Who cares? We're never going to know. know. We're never going to know. Could find out tomorrow. What if? Yeah. What if somebody calls us up later yeah, today? Exactly. <laughs> What's going to happen tomorrow? Some if we If someone was coming here, we'd see it already. Go okay? look at. Go watch the movie Contact well, again. Eventually we would get we would their see it, but maybe tomorrow before. is when we first yeah. got yeah. When we it. hear from them. I'm, right. I'm negative about that. It's fine. Think about, you know, I mean, this I don't believe, but what a mind boggler it would be if we discovered DNA somewhere that had this, it was the same structure, same code, right? Hey. That changes everything. Right. I don't, I, I don't believe that would happen, but who the hell knows? Yeah, Vincent, one of the sci-fi books I read, Mm -hmm. um, we get transmissions and they say that they left right after the transmissions were sent. And so they're like 400 years away. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. We're on our way. Well, it's it's fine. It's just hard for me to wrap my head around that, you know, (laughs) but I stick the viruses, which are so cool. And they're right here on earth. Alan, what do you have for us? Virus. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes, I have a virus, and I, I'm sorry to pick a downer, but this was um, this came up in my news feeds. I said, "Oh, okay, we got to We have to mention this, <sighs> and it's not really a snippet or a paper, but uh, as we've talked about a number of times, there's an av- avian flu um, that's been spreading around the world, uh, killing off birds wherever it goes, and it has finally reached the Galapagos Islands. Bummer. Yes, so." Um, they have found that somebody found a few dead birds um, uh, on one of the islands, and they tested them because, of course, they do that. And uh, a couple of them tested positive for this avian flu, which means it is there, undoubtedly carried by migratory birds that come through that area. Um, and just a little background on the the Galapagos is, uh, if you ever go there, it, it's like. It's a little like scrubbing into a BSL-3. It's um, like you arrive at the airport. They, on the plane there, they fumigate the overhead compartment and the baggage compartment. You get off the plane and you go through, you know, the usual sorts of arrival things that if you hadn't already checked into Ecuador. But you had to have a special park pass to get there. And then they inspect your luggage two more times before they let you out of the airport. Because they're so terrified of any kind of invasive species. Because everything that has managed to invade there mm. has just been a disaster. Um, like they've got blackberry bushes. You think, well, how bad are blackberry bushes? They're a horrific threat in the Galapagos Islands. that are just taking over and displacing native plants. Um, and now avian flu is there. And of course, they have endemic, many endemic species there, uh, including Darwin's finches that are um, susceptible to it. And now they're just bracing to see what happens. Mm. Wow. Yeah, birds fly. Yeah, birds so fly. They, so that's going to go everywhere. That's yep. going to spread. Okay, my pick is a blog post by someone named Chris Arnade. He's got a he's got a uh, Substack called Chris Arnade Walks the World. You you have to pay for it, most of it, but some posts are open. And I found this one which I really liked. It's called "Why the U.S. Can't Have Nice Things: A Rant on Bus Stops." It's basically this, he walks, he goes to different places and he walks for weeks and weeks. I don't know what he does for a living, but he gets to walk wherever he goes and he writes about it. And and he spent two weeks walking without a car in South LA. And, you know, he came across these bus stops, which are, are, you know, there's this thing called La Sombrita, which they're touting as a, a shelter for bus stops. There is a bus system in LA, but for the most part, the bus stops are crappy. 
And this one they built, they're touting it. And it can shelter one person, really. <laughs> and it's ridiculous. And he's making fun of this. And he says, basically, the U.S. can't make anything nice because, and, and other countries can. He, 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 he talks about Taipei or Quito, who can do bus stops properly. And his idea is that the problem with the U.S. is that we are a high regulation, low trust society. So, you know, all the chairs are being taken out of Penn Station because they don't want homeless people to sleep on them. Okay. When I'm waiting for a train, I can't sit down. There, there's no more benches. They're gone because we're a low trust society. And he said, other places, depending, you can have a low regulation, high trust or high regulation, high trust or low regulation, low trust. You can get better public works without fear of vandalism or misuse like you get in Quito and in Taipei. And so I think this is an interesting uh, idea uh, that we have this high regulation aspect couched in, in the language of safety, but it doesn't allow organic growth. And so you make these crappy projects that that fail. Whereas in Quito, you make a bus stop and it attracts street vendors and they have umbrellas and they make it safer. But here where you'd say no vendors on the street, right? You can't be. So I thought this was great. I really like this. This is a really interesting framework for thinking about it. This high regulation, high trust, low regulation, yeah. low trust yeah, exactly. axis and where we, and we, that's exactly where we yeah. are on it. It's, it's, yeah. it's really, and it's just, he goes to a lot of countries and he says, it's wonderful, you know, they're, they're often poor, but they know how to do things and they grow organically because- And they don't have regulations stopping yeah. them from doing it. We have yeah. too many regulations. I'm sorry. Well, or too few, depending, I mean- Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. We have a listener pick from As Free Solo, a documentary about Alex Honnold's free solo climb of El Capitan in Yosemite. Free solo means climbing without a rope and alone. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I think uh, yeah, I've seen this. Uh, it's terrifying. <laughs> yeah. uh, it is absolutely terrifying, and I can't and I can't understand. Uh, you know, people who do this. I mean, you are uh, millimeters from death. Yeah, all day long for hours. Really weird. Yeah, guys. It's uh, it's uh, it's great. Actually, it, it's a great movie. Okay. Because it's, but it's, it's terrifying. As a matter of fact, as I recall, he, you know, he did this, he, I think it was even a friend of his. That, yeah, it was a, a team, right? Where one of these guys uh, photographs or films this guy doing these free climbs. And while he was doing this one, the guy filming it had to just walk away from his camera several times because he just couldn't watch. Right. Yeah, you don't want to watch someone fall, no. right? No. no. Yeah. And it can happen any minute. Well, you man. know, there's uh, a geez. one of our colleagues' son fell down El Capitan and got killed. Is that right? Yeah, I don't. I can't remember who it is, but uh, it's a it's a one of our science colleagues and a kid. He was climbing and he slipped and fell. That was it. At the end of the day, you know, when he was wow. tired. Yeah. My gosh. All right, that'll do it for TWIV 1049. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. You can send your questions and comments to TWIV at microbe.tv. And if you like our work in science communication, please support us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Brianne Barker's at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. I learned a lot. Rich Condit, Meredith Professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. Alan Dove, alandove.com, turbidplaque.com. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at microbe.tv. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV. Ronald Jenkins for the music and Jolene for the timestamps. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV. It is viral. <laughs>